So hi everyone, I'm here with Blair DeMarco Wetlaufer today, who's the president and CEO of Kingston Data and Credit. Blair, thanks very much to, for joining me. Not a problem. Happy to be here. Um, so I know you also have a, a key role in the in the RMA as well, Receivables Management Association in Canada. And I know we, we've been chatting quite a bit in terms of receivables, the Canadian marketplace and what's going on there. And we've had this recent survey out as well, just in terms of like questionnaire that you guys have been in partnership with. What's, so at arrears levels, what are some of the things that, that you've been picking up in the Canadian market, at least anyway, recently? Well, uh, what I have noticed personally, working in the third party collection agency space, is there's uh, we've been inundated. And there are a couple of reasons for that. Obviously, people have bounced back to, to pre-pandemic spending habits. A number of people lowered their debt load during the pandemic. Equifax did a lovely survey saying people under the age of 40 reduced their credit card debt by 30% over a period mm -hmm. of six months. And a lot of there was a lot of discussion of that back in 2021 or so. And obviously, the biggest reason for that is there was, a, was no opportunity for impulse buying. You didn't go to the mall and end up walking out with five pairs of jeans you didn't expect to buy. If you wanted to buy something, you had to go on Amazon. You had to wait two days. It was a planned purchase. And obviously, everything opened back up. And now people are have returned to previous buying habits. I want to go to the movies. I want to go out to dinner. But going out to dinner now is double the cost of what it was in 2020. Mm. Debt levels have risen. On the other end of the spectrum, the other issue we've had is we re we we through another contact from the RMA, we reached out to the Ontario Registrar of Collection Agencies. And pre-pandemic to now, or 2019 till now, over half the collection registered collection agencies in Ontario, which is fairly reflective of Canada, are gone. We went mm. from 400 odd registered agencies to about 170. Mm. And has there been consolidation then in the market? Is that consolidation yeah, I, I, that's going to happen, do you think? So I am certain there's been consolidation. I'm certain that the bulk of the ones that vanished were smaller operators mm -hmm. that the pandemic caused stresses that they couldn't cope with, either technology stresses or manpower stresses, or they had all their eggs in one basket with two clients who said stop collecting mm -hmm. during the pandemic and mm -hmm. they couldn't weather that storm. But a number of the larger agencies have have struggled with manpower and whatnot. So I think people have been merging from manpower more than, oh, I want to acquire your portfolios or your mm. executive suite. And so the arrears level seems like they're starting to pick up again recently, I suppose. And how have, how's the agency world been reacting to that? What do you see the future in terms of how that plays out? Because it feels like it hasn't really flowed all the way through yet. Certainly when oh, I was there in the year, it felt arrears levels were on the cusp of maybe going up or going up more significantly but it felt like it was it was waiting to happen rather than actually being live and the new volume versus existing volume i suppose we've seen that bubble of business hit us in certain mm. segments we're seeing it in fitness telecommunications utilities household expenses that's already flowed through to the agencies it's already been an, a large increase i'd say 20 30 percent more like mm. client the clients that have consistently listed with us pre-pandemic are now listing 20 30 percent more than they did pre-pandemic. And does that present things like uh, resourcing challenges and like how do you get through the volume, et cetera? Is well, that, the other is, challenge, is that, right? Is that the current issue, is it? Hiring, hiring has been a challenge. Mm -hmm. During pre-pandemic, we, we have multiple branches. So we might post an ad local to one of our branches in Abbotsford, British Columbia or Sarnia, Ontario. Mm -hmm. And pre-pandemic, we'd post and we'd get 80 applicants. During mm -hmm. the heart of the pandemic, we'd post and we'd get five applicants. And it's thought quite a bit. We're now getting more like 60 applicants. And I'm sure it would be a higher number of applicants if we were in the GTA or what have you. So it's better, but we've got the steamroll effect of all this extra business and business we've received that we wouldn't have had pre-pandemic because agencies that were getting it are no longer there or creditors are making changes themselves or creditors are shorthanded manpower wise. So we've got a we've got a double knock on effect of we have extra business and we need to man to it. Now, we're lucky because we have a number of modern technology tools like SMS and email and what have you. Hmm. So we can make our team members more effective. Obviously, a predictive dialer can call 500 calls per agent per day, but it gets a 0.4% response rate. But we can use SMS and email for 500 contact attempts a day and get a 5 or 10% response rate.
Mm. And so there's one of the things that definitely struck me is the transformation into digital or the adoption of digital and where it sits. Where do you think that kind of sits generally across both creditors and then in, in the agency market? Consumers have already moved to digital communications. We all get a little bit of dopamine when we respond to the blinky red light on our phone. We know that. You and I know yeah. that. But the creditors, larger creditors are fighting the way through their compliance and legal departments to be allowed to text people and finding vendors that can provide digital communication services or large creditors developing their own. I talked to a creditor at one point and they're like, oh, we're going to send these many texts. Okay. How are you going to respond to them? We'll call them. No, if they're texting you, you have to text them back, that sort of thing. And agencies, agencies, same thing. Agencies often work on off the shelf CMS software and not all those communication programs have the options of digital communications baked into them. So they're having to bolt on third-party vendors and figure out how to make that work. The workflow, agencies have an all, as a whole haven't figured out that workflow yet, that live response time. Because if somebody texts you and you respond within five, five minutes, you expect someone to respond back to you within five minutes. If they respond to you yeah. the next day, you've lost all that sense of urgency. Yeah. And what's the hold up, particularly from a creditor point of view, in terms of adopting some of these new technologies? Because I think you're right, which is consumers have adopted it. Walk in the street in Toronto, at least anyway, and people on the phone yeah. in Toronto like they are anywhere else in the in, in the world. It's Digital seems to be pervasive, but it, what's the hesitation, do you think, that you're hearing, really? I, your credit manager is jumping up and down saying, I want to use these tools. And they're getting internal mm. friction. How can we know you're talking to the right person? How are, you know, you're disclosing personal information mm. about a debt. How are you going to do it in a reliable, safe manner? And mm. Compliance departments, obviously, sometimes are their own worst enemies. If I call you and say, mm. Chris, you know, I, have, I get a file for Chris Warburton and it has your telephone number. Mm. And I phone you and ha say, hi, is Chris Warburton there? And you say, yes, this is Chris. And I say, Chris, mm. you owe mm. TELUS $867. I've verified you through two mm. pieces of information. I had your phone number and I verified you by name. If that's acceptable, mm. it should also be acceptable in the digital world. So if I text you and you, Chris, mm. this is very important. I need to speak to you. And you say, well, this is Chris. What's this all about? Okay. Now mm. I've verified you through two pieces of information, which the Privacy Commission of Canada says you must have, if you're disclosing personal information, you must have a process. They don't dictate the process. You just have to have one. But compliance departments mm. tend to, to escalate internally going, this could happen or that could happen. And we've had in over the years, I've had creditors, you had a piece of paper out on a desk on a third story office. Somebody could look in the window. No, they can't. You know, so sometimes it gets unreal. Yeah. Do you think if there's a, I suppose, a wave of volume coming through and a wave of arrears coming through, it's going to cause a bit of a cost crisis and digital is obviously one way of solving that. Do you think that's going to make it easier to adopt some of these technologies just in terms of the internal discussions? Because it sounds like you guys are already doing it, but it's the internal discussions getting the clients to agree to it, isn't it? Do you think that's, do you think that's a potential that actually could happen in terms of being the burning platform to make the change? It might open the doors a little more. It might give the credit managers who are already screaming for these tools to be put at their disposal mm. to have numbers to back them up saying, if you don't give us this tools, it's going to hurt our bottom line. And that would be lovely yeah. because yeah. SMS or email over at telephone calls are still in integral. You can't have fine negotiation over a $20,000 defaulted mortgage via text. You need to have a, con a, a live conversation with somebody. But right now, collection agencies and not just us but other collection agencies the challenge isn't convincing someone to pay the challenge is in this last decade is co connecting with somebody because in the 80s if i phoned you and your phone was bolted to the wall and you know it's ringing and all the phones in the house are ringing and someone's yelling would someone get that you're going to answer the phone now i call you you see a toll-free number you don't recognize in your contacts list come up on your phone you swipe to silent you put your phone upside down um, so you need yeah. to encourage consumers to have contact with you. And sometimes a, a text or an email can start that conversation in a non-confrontational way, a non-scary way that encourages communication. And then the consumer isn't, doesn't mind the communication because people who owe money are stressed, right? And their natural re reaction sometimes is to ostrich, to stick their head in the ground. But if you reach out in a non-aggressive manner, hey, I just want to talk to you. Hey, you have a couple options hey, this is serious, but I'm here to help you. Then the consumer communicates with you. They have relief that you've helped them. You haven't put, pushed them down. You've lifted them up. And then the consumer, the creditor gets paid and everybody's happy. 
Yeah. Yeah. I know we've talked for at length for many years around customer treatment and how to treat customers and those kind of things. What kind of approaches are you finding best to get that initial engagement? Is it that soft approach in terms of trying to just trying to get people, once you've got someone engaged, then you can have the rest of the conversation. What's your sort of secret source? to certain Well, things? I've always, even with telephone communication, started soft and escalated. When I worked in a collection agency back in the 80s, they had the opening done under a piece of glass and we had to say it verbatim. Then Mr. Jones, you owe $10,824.56. At what point today can we expect payment in full? No, that never yeah. worked because it creates a confrontational environment. How about starting the call? Hi, Bob, my name's Blair. How are you? So you can still carry on that kind of tone in email or SMS. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously you have to make sure you have, you can't just disclose everything. You can't just vomit forth. Hey, you owe this much money. Here's the payment link. Great. That's awesome. You yeah. actually have to verify you have the right contact. You can't email somebody at a work email address blindly. Some good life fitness sends me 5,000 accounts and I email all 5,000 accounts, including Bob at ABC widgets. Bob's not at ABC yeah. widgets anymore. His email has been forwarded to Marsha at ABC widgets. And now I've disclosed mm -hmm. third party information and you've got to use it responsibly. But you can reach out, hi, this is, I'm trying to reach you. It's very important we communicate. And then see, and give the consumer. So if we text a consumer, we put a live collector's name in it. It's not, please text back Kingston Data and Credit. It's, please text back Selena Rose. You know, this is Selena Rose texting you. Here's my phone number. Here's my email address or text me back. Mm -hmm. And then the consumer gets a choice. They can pick up the phone and call. They can respond via text or they can email whatever channel they prefer. And then we identify it as this is a, this is an email consumer. And then we shut down all the other consumer channels, the communication channels and focus on email because that's what that consumer wants. And I suppose, and I know you do work in Canada as well as the U S as well. Do you find there's different differences, differences between the two markets and even between states, right? Within the U S or provinces in Canada, but how do you see the differences? Do you adjust your strategy by the different locations? Is it very different? It's very different. Yeah. Up to November, 2021, um, the FDCPA was in the States was silent on digital communications. And then they passed Regulation F. So they added a 456 page appendix to a 20 page law. And, and of mm. course, it's clear as mud. But it mm. states now that if you're making a telephone communication with somebody, whether you contact them or leave a message on their answering machine, you can only try once every seven days. So you mm. have to slow down the telephone communication. I'm not sure what other com agencies in the States are doing with their predictive dialers, but I would imagine they're shutting mm. them down or paring down the number of ad communications significantly. Never mind that was mm. a legislative landmine. If you accidentally used a predictive dialer to call a cell phone in the States, you were you could have a TCPA violation for $100 per call, mm. that sort of thing. Um, but they also put in Regulation F that electronic communications, and they identify that as email, you can send an unlimited number. Now, I don't think you mm -hmm. should email somebody 30 times a day. I don't think that's, I don't <laughs> think phishing with a machine gun is an effective strategy, but we consumers in the, in, in the U S versus consumers in Canada still have their smartphones still are responding to the blinky red light. So yes, you can use a similar strategy, but in the U S you've got to have the FDCPA mini Miranda. You've got to have, if they live in the state of Georgia, you have mm -hmm. to have this disclaimer. So we're relying more on email than SMS in the U S because it's, we're less, we're more bomb proof versus a frivolous lawsuit, but we still right. are communicating via SMS. And certainly when a consumer says I'm driving, can you text me? Absolutely. We can identify that consumer as a, as an SMS consumer and communicate with them via SMS, but we're doing more email in the U S. Hmm. Hmm. And I suppose, how much of it do you think is driven by the, I mean, it's these things, isn't it? It's the, I talk about the smartphones, right? It just feels like you've got this multi-communication device that sort of sits in your palm of your hand. And it's, I suppose, anything that goes to that. Do you think there are other communication channels we need to use? This has got email on, it's got telephone on, it's got SMS on, but there's WhatsApps out there. I suppose there's other kind of chat or chat kind of processes that are out there. Where do you think, what else do we need to look at? Chatbots as an example. Bots well. are a good place to start developing. Now, obviously that's not a, hmm. that's not an out going communication channel that's incoming a consumer goes to your website and wants to mm. chat and we see that through google business and obviously mm. we're trying to right now we're developing a chat bot on our website that will basically just mm. bring in the google business chat right there 
but it's, it's technologically challenging, right? Especially when you have multiple mm -hmm. Google business locations for each of your branches. So I may have made my life more difficult a few years ago when I decided <laughs> to do multiple branches, but certainly, and obviously a lot of people are talking, we can get AI working. I don't think we're there yet. I don't think the AI chats are capable enough to negotiate with people. I don't know. Have you had a chance to play with chat GPT at all? Yeah, I have. I've seen it. I was going to, that's going to be my next question around what you think of it. I've played and with it a bit, the opportunities but I, I, mean, I find it making up. And actually, I read an article on this this morning. They're finding that chat GPT, when it's asked to write an essay, it makes up imaginary quotes from imaginary people. Yeah. So yeah. It, if it can't quote something reliably, do we want it discussing finances with somebody? I don't think we're quite there yet. It does sound like a lot of social media, though, where they, people just make things up and it's got no, no basis in fact on some of these. Maybe, maybe it's been reading Twitter too much. I don't know. The fact piece seems like that's a challenge. But where do you think there are applications for the kind of stuff that you've seen? Chat would be one, although it sounds like it's not there yet. For us, it's you know, not there. I think I've, a couple I've, agencies are breaking the ice there. And I know I know uh, PRA, when they were active capital. Even a couple of years ago, before PRA came in, actually that's about four years ago, they had a, an excellent chat function on their website. They had, would you like to work out payment arrangements? Please punch in the following information. And they had algorithm. So it wasn't AI, but it was a decision-making machine that said, if they say this and this, then offer them this settlement or this payment arrangement. So I think we're getting there, but it's not completely intuitive yet. Yeah, I certainly think things like tone of voice and being able to change tone of voice and communications, those, that seems much more adaptive than I've ever seen before. It's just it's that, that kind of stuff. It's like magic a little bit. I understand a little bit about the math, but I don't really, it still seems like magic. I, I don't know. But maybe, do you think, do you think that's going to enable almost like more tailored collections? Do you think we'll be able to become even more specific and tailored around customers' individual circumstances or how they would best respond to particular approaches in terms of advisory around getting them out of debt or supporting them? I'd like to see that. Obviously, that mm. to build those machines mm. or build those processes, that's going to require collection agencies and creditors to have empathy and mm. to sympathize with consumer situations. And sometimes we don't see the tree for the forest and yeah. that empathy, get, that moment of empathy gets lost. You know, obviously, yeah. if you have a creditor jumping at an agency, wow, oh, we need you to collect $200,000 or we're going to give your business to another agency. Obviously, that's driving numbers, not empathy or collectors sitting in their in the, in their cubicle and they're being told if you hit this, you get a bonus. OK, money is more important than empathy. So you have to it depends on the structure you build. One of the things we do with our staff. We do a monthly scorecard that affects their salaries and how they're doing and how much time they can spend working from home. And we've factored in Google reviews. And if a, if a collector gets a positive Google review, they get a, a very significant score bump on their scorecard because we want to encourage that. And because we've encouraged that, it's fostered a community of collector A talking to collector B. Hey, you got a Google review. That's amazing. How did you do that? I was reasonable and mm. I took my time. And it fostered, if you game out the results you want and build the structure that rewards the behaviors you want, then you can encourage people are people. They go to work. They want to be recognized. They want to do a good job. And if you can make them feel good about getting a positive review from a consumer, then they're going to, they're going to lean in that direction. I'm going to ask the question first, and, I, and we'll talk about talk a little bit about the UK afterwards. But but taking that almost like softer approach in terms of collections, I mean, what have you seen that do in terms of actual collections itself, in terms of like dollars collected and the actual collection rates? Has that had any effect? So what ends up happening is um, if we were against a hardcore, I want my $10,824.86 today, the hardcore agency will out collect us in the first 60 days because they'll spike up. Uh, their liquidation, and then it'll stop. Where ours is more of a slow build bell curve because we're being a little more patient with people. We're being a little more reasonable. It ends up with a longer tail end because we haven't alienated people. You know, if, if you're if you're binary, give me the money now or else. Well, the people who don't give you the money, you've gone to the or else. You can't go anywhere. Whereas if you're being reasonable. You know, okay, you've worked out payment arrangements, you're getting payments, people are reaching back out. I, I you know you were kind to me and I 60 days ago and now I have a job and I remembered you weren't yelling and screaming like the other four agencies, so now I'm going to pay you first. Mm. So you end up with this tail end, and you do end up with 20 to 50 percent higher liquidation than the competition. 
So sometimes when yeah. we're working with creditors, you're like, we're not the fastest out of the gate. You've got to bear with us. If you yeah. look at our liquidation at the 12 month mark, I guarantee it will be higher. And here's why. And here are example cases and what have you. But it, yeah. it will perform better, but it takes longer. Yeah, so it was the fable is almost like it pays. Good things come to people who wait. Exactly. The thing that's happened. Certainly in the UK, we've obviously, as we've chatted before, there's been a lot of sort of focus around treating customers fairly. Now there's a consumer duty that's out there and this whole sort of approach around that. And that was certainly our experience over here, which is it's, there's a lot of brand equity that you build up and it doesn't have a negative effect in terms of collections. But it's just interesting in terms of like, do you think that that kind of approach is shifting in North America. I mean, you know, we've chatted about it before and you're clearly bought into that whole kind of approach around supportiveness. Do you think it's going to change? Do you think it's going to change? Is it changing? I think it has um, been for a number of years. Like you remember that United Airlines fiasco where somebody was volunteered oh, yeah. to come off the plane and somebody recorded it with a phone and United Airlines shares dropped, like they lost a billion dollars in 30 days in their share prices. That sort of thing yeah. is already cluing creditors into brand awareness and hmm. creditors that don't have to go through an RFP department or a compliance department, they already get it. They are already realizing, hmm. Hey, it, one angry consumer can take a negative experience and put it on the internet forever. And it will forever hmm. harm our brand reputation. Bigger companies that are still doing RFPs and going to the lowest bidder and they don't care about brand reputation. Like sometimes there's a disconnect and certainly only, I'd say, 10, 20% of the agencies out there have ever even Googled themselves. So I think it's advanced in some areas, but it, we've still got a long way to go in, in others. Yeah, yeah, I just wonder if, particularly if we get into an economic deterioration, does that sort of, you're not going to get the, those fast payments in quite the same way as they were because the capacity to pay isn't necessarily right. there. So if you look over the longer period where customers' situations have time to change, does it lend itself to that kind of approach? Yes, it does, but it's getting everyone to buy into that and being patient. And obviously, creditors and companies and agencies, they all have stressors of, we have to pay the bills and keep the lights on. So yeah, it's yeah. a balancing act, but it's always been a balancing act. <laughs> yeah. Now, we talked a bit about volume and we talked a bit about staffing and getting new employees, employees in. One of the big sort of friction points that's been is really around remote work versus in the office, right? So I wanted to chat a bit about that. And it does feel like there's quite a difference between certainly what I hear in Europe and what I heard in North America in terms of the approach that's been taken. In North America, there was much more of a push to getting people back in the office. Even some of the large, even some of the large banks in, in, in the UK and in Europe are much more open to hybrid working, remote working. It's really hybrid working and it's gradually tending to go back in the office rather than you will get back to the office what's what are you kind of hearing over there what's your kind of view in terms of what works yeah. obviously the pandemic hit march 14th 2020 everybody go work from home and again i was very fortunate that i made a number of mistakes that made our company pandemic resistant because we had multiple branches mm -hmm. and first of all we went from a culture of at that point five branches to 50 branches of one. So it wasn't that big a leap. We already had internal chat programs to communicate with each other. We already had, if somebody's not physically there, this is how we communicate. That was already there. So I'm going, and also having multiple branches, we didn't have one high rise office in Toronto where we had to send 400 people home. They all tried to log in and that high rise agency in Toronto didn't have enough internet bandwidth to support 400 remote locations. We were very lucky that mm. way. And what we did, we decided as the pandemic, as the, the rules were loosening for, for being able to work in the office, because Canada was very regiment. It was these people, you have to work from home during this lockdown or what have you. We actually surveyed our staff because obviously our, some of our staff were, I never want to come back to the office. And some of the staff were, I need to work in the office. I have two teenage children. For the love of God, let me come mm. back. Got to be in. Get out. And so we end up surveying our staff and we ended up building our back to normal plan, our end day plan. Whenever all the uh, pandemic mm. was lifted and, and everything was unlocked, and we said, okay, let's go forward with the end day plan. And then two weeks later, oh, everything's locked mm. down again. Okay, we'll postpone the end day plan. But we ended up with, we ended up putting that plan in place in late 2021. And we said, you're an experienced staff member. You're not a compliance risk. You're working fine from home. You have no issue working from home. You need to come into the office four days a month. We couldn't care less what four days. 
You want to come in the, every Monday? Mm. That's fine. You want to come in the first four days and we don't see you for a month? That's fine. Now, we've always been a millennial friendly, just deliver the results, show us that you're working, we will leave you alone. So that's translated well. Now, during the pandemic, we had some, because collections is an art form, you end up with a sense of osmosis. If you have 20 people in a room, <laughs> pardon me, and they're all making calls and someone makes a bad call, someone will turn around and go, why did you say that? You lose that if people are working in isolation at home. It's not like they're programmers coding. So we did have a couple staff who started veering off to the side and we listened to them and why are you saying that? That's confrontational. Mm. And they didn't realize because it, it was by millimeters that they changed their approach. Mm. So we did have to develop that plan to say, okay, you've gotten off the beaten path. Let's get you in the office 10 days a month and get mm. you back on track. And then you can go back to four days a month and we can do a course correction and out you go. And we also found during the pandemic, obviously when we were hiring, we were trying to hire, we're like, okay, come in. You've been trained for two weeks, go home. You know, that was a far too quick booting people out the door. So we had to work out, okay, your first 30 days, you're in the office every day, you're being trained. Okay, next month, if you've had a positive staff scorecard, now you can work from the office only 10 days a month. Your second scorecard, okay, four days a month. If your scorecard slips to this point, you come back in. So we ended up with a gradiated, almost not in the office, half the time in the office, always in the office. And people can move around that. So talking to other agencies, a lot of them are all over the board. Some are, everybody's back in the office. Mm. And sometimes it's because they lost productivity and they don't know why. Sometimes it's because the mm. creditors are demanding it. We want all, our compliance department says everybody has to be in the office physically for security requirements. If you want our business, you have to have everyone back in. It, it's a variety. But I have noticed, obviously, I, I remember our office out in British Columbia. One of the, we posted an ad. Normally I would say we get like 30, 40 applications. We got 90. And they were almost all mm. from one agency. And, and we're, what's going on? And we interviewed a couple mm. candidates and they're like, yep, they told us to come back into the office full time. I'm looking for a new job. People mm. expect the ability to work from home at least a little bit at this point. Do you th and is that still written, an unwritten rule that's out there that people, employees really are still looking for that flexibility, even though maybe employers are trying to move away from that a little bit. Do you think, right. do you think and, that's still well, And I don't think it's, I think employers are bending. Like certainly consumers are, the employees that you want to hire are going to drive the bus on this. I do believe yeah. that companies are trying to accommodate people working from home, but it's finding that fine balance because working in isolation is not good for the long-term culture of your company because you don't have a culture because people aren't sharing space and communicating. We had one staff member, great staff member. She was, I never want to come back in the office. Oh, and we called, we said, okay, you have to come in four days. And the first day she came in, there were only two people in the office that day and she did her work and she turned around and, oh, would you believe that last call to the other person in the office? And she went out to lunch with them and came back and she came into the office at the end of the day and said, you were right. I needed that. Yeah. I think people, people making decisions in boardrooms or in compliance departments, they're sometimes forgetting the human, the human part of things. Yeah worked a lot in different companies on culture. Culture is important. If people like where they work and they feel valued, they will give 110%. And you can't, yeah. you can't buy that loyalty. You have to earn that loyalty by building an environment that's friendly. Um, if you create an environment, you know, pre-pandemic where you didn't hear your target, you're fired. You create a sense of disposable mm. employees. They're not going to care about your company because they could be gone next month. If you create an environment mm. where you shame them. You have a whiteboard and go write your collection numbers for the day on the whiteboard. You're shaming the people not succeeding. You're not lifting them up. If you create a dog eat dog environment where people, it's a free for all and you know, somebody can take a collection file and, but this person was nice to them. There are all sorts of little things. And I've written about this on my blog. Here are ways that you can sabotage your collection agency and create an environment of fear and hate and uncertainty. You don't want that. And if everyone's working from home, you can't build a fostering environment as easily. So you need some in-person, but it's but what's the right level. Yeah, but that's some fundamental work that you need to do beforehand. So like people will come back in the office if they want to be back in the office and if it's going to be better for them to be back in the office than being at home. As, and that, that's environmental, isn't it? It's cultural, right? You can make so, it worse. I have a friend who works in IT and they called her back into the office 50% of the time and she worked for an insurance company. 
and they had reorganized the office so her desk wasn't her desk. So she had to, anything she wanted on her desk, she had to bring in with her at the beginning of the day and take out at the end of the day. So she couldn't create a space because her desk was being shared by someone else later. That's a cost-cutting measure that harmed the culture of that person coming into the office and made coming into the office a negative experience. They don't have a picture of their kids. They don't have their coffee cup there. Mm. Little simple things. Sometimes mm. it's important to leave their desk empty and it's their desk. So they know when they come in, it's mm. their space. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's interesting how culture goes throughout the whole of this. And sometimes this can be stuff that's happened for the last 10 years as well that sort of has been building up, isn't it? So it's like it takes time to, to change the direction to certain extent. Culture is incredibly so, hard to turn, 100%. So we've been through all this. We talked a bit about digital. We talked a bit about customer treatment. We talked a bit about employees. Where do we go next from here? What's what's next? What's next in the environment? And what we've got to look out for in the next year or so? Obviously, there are a lot of stressors being put on consumers. Housing prices are out of control. People aren't able to go out for dinner once a week anymore because the cost has doubled. Com- companies are still figuring out what their new normal is. We can't really predict what the future is going to be. Like when I went to Spain, Going out for dinner was an experience. Like the North America is, can I have the check? I'm done. And they're like, no, you're going to be here for four hours. That was very alien to me. I would not be surprised if we start getting into that going out for dinner is an experience because it's going to be $100, $150. Going to the movies is going to be a, a rarer experience. People living outside of big urban centers where housing might be affordable and having remote work is likely can't tell you for sure. We're definitely in a space where things are changing. Where they're going, I don't know. But we need to be we need to be flexible. The companies that are inflexible are the ones that are closing their doors. The companies that are willing yeah. to look at new communication channels, new ways to treat their staff, new new workflows are going to be the ones that are going to be standing 5 years from now. Yeah. It's interesting. It's going to be an interesting journey in terms of what's happening. You just feel like it was a bit of a an inflection point in society, between almost like before the pandemic and now after the pandemic. And these things don't happen overnight; they happen over about a decade. So, um, the, and you wonder if the Spanish flu of 1914 and then the Roaring Twenties. Yeah. You know, everyone bounced back to yeah. super social. I think we're going to have the something thirties, the twenty thirties. But yeah. I don't know what's going to be. I, I don't. But it's going to be a react. People have been fundamentally changed by the pandemic. There's a lot more anxiety in individuals. There's a lot more, I joke with my friends, everybody went a little bit crazy in the pandemic. I I know Mm. one fellow, he decided to buy board games. He has 200 unopened board games. Everybody was, (laughs) I find, normally I'm fairly extroverted. I find after I've been in a a extroverted social situation, I'm exhausted. Peopling is hard now. Yeah, Yeah, everybody's been fundamentally affected. So how we go as a culture through, that's going to be interesting. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be a fascinating time. Blair, thanks very much. I know we we chatted quite a bit, and usually we find plenty to talk about. So I appreciate making the time. And finally, we've done the interview and got you on. I got you on. I hope I didn't and ramble I say too for, much. For, no, it's perfect. And I will say just for everyone watching that the RMA survey, I think it's still out there. We've got some early results that have been sent out to people, but I think we'll put it in the links. We'll put it in the links below just if people want to join it and then they'll get a copy of the results as well. Absolutely. So it's super interesting, I know. And I yeah, I appreciate the RMA for helping partner on that. That's good. Okay. Thanks very much, Blair. Really appreciate making the time. Not a problem.